Hi everybody, welcome to chapter 12 of Money in Schools. This is our big idea where we're specifically looking at site-based leadership. As I've noted throughout this textbook, um, site-based leadership is kind of the driver that our, that our authors have focused on. So we're gonna talk a little bit about why this is important and why the book comes together around this concept. This and the next chapter really give us this idea of schools as a loosely coupled system. Those of you that have had organizational theory, you understand the concept of white and schools as a loosely coupled system, basically showing you that different classrooms, different areas have different autonomy, um, and this gives you the autonomy to the building principle under a site-based management system. We want this in theory because we want the principal to have say. It decentralizes our school and the principal can, can have, can have more say over this. This isn't coming from the book, but this is coming from my guess. My guess is this. We're gonna see district consolidation first before we go to site-based management. A lot of states have too many school districts, and I think a lot of them are gonna to have to merge together to create issues related to taxes, um, just to try to, try to support the tax system. Then we're gonna see more site-based budgeting and management. Um, you will probably see this at some point. Like I said before, if you're a charter, private school, religious school, yeah, you're gonna do site-based management, you're already doing it. But um, this stuff really, um, I think you're gonna see consolidation first. So future schools, you're gonna to have to keep this in mind. This could occur for those of you that are young in your career. Um, it's the point of the entire book, and it's kind of showing you that, you know, these are the people that stand on the firing line of schools, are the ones that make the decisions related to site-based management. So our site-based concept is that individual schools have responsibility for curriculum, staffing, and budgeting decisions, and it's real responsibility. They get their own budget, they set their goals, they have their own performance assessments, and they determine whether or not they've been successful or they failed. When students are located at these levels, this can help with the daily operation of schools, this gives you more autonomy, but also more responsibility as well. So, this is the future. Charter schools and private schools are already doing this, and they are your competition because they're taking your tax dollars. Public schools, in order to be in a competitive environment, many school districts are gonna to go to site-based management. You have to understand what this looks like because this could impact you. It might not now, might not be five years, but definitely in the future. So this is complex um, because you have to do it and it has to be approved by the district and the school board and they already have control and autonomy over what's going on in schools. So this creates an even bigger challenge as well. So site-based management is really done on three different concepts and it's done under organizational theory. It's the belief that lasting change has to be brought about by planning carefully. Notice, everything related to finance ties back into what you would use organizational theory for. Three different objectives exist with this. You have to look at the history and data on the readiness of the school site. Where did it come from? Where is it going? What assessment findings tell you what the school needs and what they're doing well and then they don't really need? And how will you have accountability built in as well? So, related to assessment, each school should have their own plan and look at that based on the district level. You have to understand what central administration thinks, what the school board thinks, and that's gonna help you as well. That's another thing that you have to consider because the school board might say that there are different needs than you think you need in your building. In every school, every organization is different. Those of you that are in districts with five elementary schools, you know that one elementary school is different than the other. I was an administrator in a district that had seven elementary schools. Mine was highly rural, highly poor. It was all the trailer parks, but right down the road, five miles from me, was all the people that lived in the gated communities and housing plants. Even though we were in the same district, same elementary school, different people, different perspectives, we didn't use site-based management, but if we did, I would have spent money on reading. I would have spent money on Marie Clay. I would have spent money on things that would actually have helped improve um, Head Start, Early Childhood, Extended Day Kindergarten, where the more affluent building in our district, um, they really didn't need that stuff. So implementation, um, the textbook really says you need to talk about the history. You need to talk to the teachers, the administration, and people that have lived in the district that have seen it go through change so that they can give you institutional history and ways that the district can grow and move forward. 
So accountability is important. You should have beliefs, missions, objectives, climate, and policy, and different parameters can be set, and accountability strategies must be agreed upon as well. So teachers in the building have to believe, and this is directly from our book, students learn basic skills as a consequence of how teachers teach, and those skills are going to be unique to the building. When you expect students to be successful, they are successful. Success is more important than failure. Sharing ideas increases student performance. That's working in collaboration with other teachers. If you coordinate programs with teams and across grade levels, that's going to improve the building. Everything should be changing based on the populations and how society is evolving. And the student should always be centralized at, this, at the educational process. So, climate. You know, we've talked about school climate. School climate is more important in site-based management than it is in a district management model because the principal now controls the climate. They control the staff and they can position it. In this model, you have autonomy and take advantage of that autonomy. So principals need to know what they can and can't do. They have to take the lead. They have to be strong individuals and delegate appropriately. It's one of the reasons why your bigger school districts, if they're recruiting building principals and they don't have anybody to internally promote, they'll look to individuals that have come from private and charter schools because they've done this already. They've done this site-based management stuff. Delegation has to be realistic. You have to know what the staff's capable of doing and what they're not capable of doing. But you're still accountable at the district level. So if they don't do what you expect to do, the district can still hold you accountable as well. So central office just, is just so, supposed to provide you with training, and that's what they're there to do. They're going to give you team skills. They're going to give you technical knowledge. They're going to work with you. They're going to help you. Um, they're going to work with the site council, but they still need to give you the autonomy what needed. So the site council now takes care of the school. They do the organizational design. They hire the personnel. They do student activities, and that's the big idea. The building principal and the district should set an idea of what membership on the site council should be. Should it be the most senior teacher in the building? Should it be an assistant principal? Should it be a secretary? Should it be a building leader? Should it be a custodial staff member? Should it have district representation? This has to be agreed upon. The district has to say what this needs to look like, and the community needs to be notified through the school board that the district is using this model. And the district has to say, does the principal have authority, or does the authority still fall in the district's power? Most membership should be 10 to 12 members. The state of Kentucky uses a five-member site-based council. Um, if you're doing it, it should have about 10 to 12 members. It should be people that understand the planning goals of the district, lead teachers, support staff, people that are interested, um, and they have to have broad perspectives on public schools. Um, one of the challenges you get into with this, which is why some people don't like it, is their individualized platforms. And that can be a problem as well. People aren't doing what's in the best interest of the building population when that happens. So if you are in a unionized environment, this is difficult. Because you have to stay within what the contract says, but you have to keep it, you have to keep the boundaries. So, you have to make sure that everybody on the site, including your parents, understand data assessment and understand responsibilities at the building and district level. So budgeting issues. The big idea here is that instruction and personnel should, should compensate 80 to 85% of your salaries, uh, of your budget, because it's going to go to teacher salaries, teacher benefits, and that's where most of the money is going to be in a site-based management model. But you have to understand transportation and facilities as well, which is why we partially covered that in this class. So you have to understand sources of revenue, state revenue, local revenue, state aid, and state accounting and reporting requirements, which we spoke about ad nauseum in this class. So the site knowledge. You have to understand everybody, every actor, every stakeholder in the organization, um, and what they do and what their responsibilities are. You have to know what the activities are in your district as well. You have to know what building principles know, and you have to be passionate about it. This is easier said than done because community members aren't trained to be building principals. Parents aren't. 
The training you're going through is unique and it's something that nobody will see. So your district has to invest in professional development for these individuals so that they can understand what's expected of them as well. And as I note, this is much easier said than done. So this is my final comment. This is the closing thing on this chapter. I believe in this model, you're going to see this in your lifetime. If you end up in a private or charter school, you need to know this. Then you become a politician, and that's added to your job description. Um, if you find a building that's going to be the best fit for you to serve as a school administrator, um, this might benefit you, this might not benefit you. So if you have any questions related to this, thank you very much.